Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, we're honored to meet with Richard Louvre, author of Last Child in the Woods and The Nature Principle. As children focus on devices, why is it important to connect them to the real life world? On tour, meet a couple who found a new perspective when their daughter was born. Daphne connects to family garden ties, and Trisha has your Backyard Basics tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. What kindles the urge to garden? For this family, it was the birth of a little girl. This garden began when a little girl was born. Until then, Deborah Paredes and Frank Garidi had never grown food. I was raised on the 25th floor of a 33-story building in the Bronx, New York. Had no clue about gardening at all. We bought the house in 2004. Mm -hmm in 2004, and the backyard had some landscaping, but there was you know, no food at all um, growing here. And um, we do love good food, and we really tried to eat responsibly. And over time, we, we in addition to wanting to sort of share this um, experience with our daughter, we really thought it just makes sense to try to be more active agents in, in how we consume. As associate professors at the University of Texas, renowned authors, community game changers, and then as new parents, their lives were already packed. To jumpstart them, they worked with Randy Jewart of Resolution Gardens to educate them and in turn, daughter Zaya. I think that was like a lot of people that we work with, that was her motivation as well, is that people want to start a garden because they want to teach their kids, which is fantastic reason for getting started. After founding Austin Green Art, Randy segued into his mission to bring healthy food and wildlife gardens to anyone who needs a helping hand. In this garden, he grubbed out dead tree roots and top growth to extend the original raised beds. We started at the ledge of the terrace, and so let's just kind of work our way up the hill and we'll add a bed behind what we've got. and. So the priority was to expand the vegetable garden and then to try to do something with the fence. To soften and ornament the fence, Randy trellised fast-growing vines. We call it hog panel. Some people call it horse fence or cattle fence or whatever, but we love the, the four-inch fencing um, because it's so flexible with what you can do with it. And it's, it's a a much cleaner look than chicken wire or any kind of welded wire that comes on a roll. In this case, you know, we stuck some of it onto the existing fence, which we do a lot with just a little spacer so the vines have room to go behind it. And then, you know, you could wire it to a T-post or in this case, some, some cedar posts, which is another thing that we'd like to use a lot as just kind of a ranch aesthetic. We like the posts with the bark on them and it has kind of a rustic look to it. You can power wash them to get the bark off, which is a fun look too. T-posts support blackberries that Zaya will be able to just pick and eat off the vine. As Randy extended the terrace, he gave them a topside get-together perch. Ever recycling, he repurposed the former owner's chinning bars to support a palm frond palapa. They have the, the cooker in the corner, and we wanted to create some shade back there because if you were standing there in the evening with the blazing sun coming over the roof, stuck in that corner, you'd be as fried as your sausages. After extending the beds and its walkways, Randy brought in good soil and compost for ornamentals, fruits, herbs, and vegetables. Then he showed the family how to cultivate them. Initially, we just wanted Randy to help us put some food in one bed, you know, like maybe a five by five foot bed or, um, you know, something very, what we thought to be very manageable, Man. <laughs> something yeah. we couldn't mess up. And it started with that. And then as the years went by, each year we just added a little more with the help of, of Resolution Gardens. Each step really felt like a leap of faith. Like we didn't quite know mm -hmm. if we could manage it at all. And we kind of felt over our heads 
pretty much from the beginning. <laughs> and yet we also felt like this is the right thing to do. And, and I also felt like it kind of taught us how to take a leap of faith. I don't have to feel precious about it. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. I don't have to be perfect. Something can, you can try something and it can fail and you can just, you have another season coming around to try again something new. There's always an element of surprise to it, right? So, I mean, like, the so the one year the tomatoes were bad, and the next year they were, like, overflowing. Or last year, eggplants just kept growing and growing and growing. Or the basil just took over, like, a huge section in the bed back there. So, I, I mean, I think there's... That, that's another thing that, that, that is it's, it's a nice surprise. Like, you know, you know, year to year, you know, something may not work, and then something works in ways that you didn't anticipate. Science learning lessons for life. I do think that she can learn a lot about how to take risks in the world, how to take leaps of faith by, you know, seeing that, you know, you may plant something and no matter your best efforts, it just may not work out. Or you may have plentitude and then what do you, what's your responsibility when you have plentitude? She understands that food is a process, like it, it's labor, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and it's not easy. I mean, on the one mm -hmm. hand, this garden is a testament to how we can learn it. But on the other hand, it requires skill. It requires, you know, people are making this food, right? So she's learning at an early age that what we consume is something that is produced and that it really requires a, an appreciation, understanding that that's how the food arrives at your table. Absolutely. And, that, and I think as people of color, that's been especially important for us yes. to instill in our daughter, you know, that food is the result of, of labor and often labor of, you know, in our case, you know, Mexican-Americans or, you know, Afro-descended people that this is, they've often been the, you know, the, the laboring force that's brought our food. As a poet and artist, Deborah enriches Zaya's perceptions on another dimension. I do think, you know, beauty's for everyone, and I really do believe that. Beauty can be created out of the everyday, and you know any functional task doesn't have to be devoid of beauty. And so, you know, one could think, oh, it's a garden, it's an edible garden, therefore it's kind of just functional. And I think, no, you know, there's absolute beauty, or whether it's just you know an appreciation, training your eye to see the beauty that's there. You know, the new buds on the peach tree, for example. Along with the sense of her place in the world and responsibility to its community, Zaya has seen how daily steps make a difference for the future. You know, if you just sort of take a season at a time, that it can be manageable on a personal level with time and, and energy and also financially to just kind of chip away at it. And you know, that's what makes it fulfilling is there's always new things to learn. I think it was the African blue basil that we let just, we let bloom. And what was so beautiful was that, well, literally beautiful, right? Is that it by, let, because there was so much, by letting some just go ahead and bloom, the, the butterflies and the yeah. flowers themselves just created a kind of beauty from, you know, what we thought to be is, you know, oh no, there's this basil we won't be able to use. And in the end, instead of saying, no, look at this basil, look who's using it, you know, the butterflies. And this is bringing us beauty. So in the end, it was absolutely useful to us by just being such a source of beauty. Thanks so much for sharing your garden experiences with us here at Central Texas Gardener. And coming up next, one of my favorite people in North America, Richard Louvre. Uh, Rich and I have known each other for a number of years, author of Last Child in the Woods, a book about what he calls nature deficit disorder in American youth, which is created a nationwide, if not international, movement to get kids reconnected with nature. Rich is here to also celebrate his new book, The Nature Principle. Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Well, thanks. Good to see you again. Well, you know, uh, gardening has something to do with Last Child in the Woods and, and The Nature Principle both. Uh, yeah. There's something very special about the activity of gardening. Well, there is. There's, there's a new body of evidence. Actually, there's evidence, more evidence about gardening and human health than some of the other aspects of connecting to nature that goes back a ways. Uh, but certainly uh, psychological well-being, uh, physical health, a sense of place, a sense of who you are, you know, your identity in a bioregion, all of that is wrapped up in, in gardening. And gardening really is a way for both kids and adults to uh, connect to nature. And while Last Child in the Woods was about nature deficit disorder, which, by the way, is not a known medical diagnosis. <laughs> Maybe it should be, but it's a way I, to talk about this. I think it this. should be. <laughs> yeah, it's a way to talk about this thing we mm -hmm. didn't have a language to, to use about. But adults, the next book, The Nature mm -hmm. Principle, looks at adults, too. We need nature for our psychological health, our physical health, our mm -hmm. spiritual health. 
When so much of what we consider health uh, has roots in our childhood experiences, and just to dwell on last child for a moment before we launch into the new yeah. book, I, I, I teach classes about gardening all the time and about the impact mm. of gardening in individual lives. And I ask people about their favorite memories associated with the outdoors and time after time after yeah. time, I'll hear stories about my grandmother's garden or those sorts of things. And it, it, the, 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 those really meaningful, yeah. powerful places in people's lives that they really think of as treasured often are the garden spaces we create. Um, early in The Nature Principle, I, I told a story about my father. And to, in my family, the, the best times were outdoors in nature. And I kind of say this as kind of a confession, say, you know, I have my bias too. That's mm. one of the reasons I, I write about nature and human beings. And I remember being in the garden, and he had a big vegetable garden in the backyard, and, and watching the back of his, his neck and how the dirt would get between the creases of his very tan neck. And, and, and getting the stones out of his way when he was working and, and all of that. And, and I loved those times with him. And it's one of the reasons that and fishing and doing other outdoor things with my father and my mother. But over time, he began to withdraw. And uh, his dream was to retire and move to the Ozarks and fish all day. And he retired early, moved down. But by that time, the mental illness and the alcoholism had, had taken him pretty far, and he never really left the kitchen table. So to me, I always associated health with that garden and with fishing, and as he withdrew from that, he withdrew from health, and he had a, uh, yeah. a sad end. And, um, uh, you know, I always wondered what would have happened if mental health professionals then had known about nature therapy, something he clearly loved. Now, whether that would have really helped him or not, I don't know. But it does, you know, form this idea that goes certainly deep within me mm -hmm. that, that our health, our well-being is very much uh, connected to that experience in a garden or on a lake or on a stream. Well, it, to me, it makes perfect sense to think of a, a species of animal, which we are, that, that spent a million and a half years in development, yeah. uh, living in the most intimate contact with nature. And then and only in the last generation or two right. has that link been severed. Yeah. And uh, the consequences of which we really are incalculable, really. Yeah, I mean, we, there's a price to pay for that. Evolution mm -hmm. doesn't work that fast. and. But the good news is that along with the evidence that there had been this dramatic break between children mm -hmm. and nature, for a lot of reasons, electronics is mm -hmm. one, only one of them, bad urban design, traffic, <laughs> you know, right. fa stranger danger, fear mm -hmm. of that, even though mm -hmm. the fear outranks the reality mm -hmm. in most neighborhoods. Um, uh, uh, there's another body of evidence that came forth at the same time, which is uh, attention deficit disorder, the symptoms of of that uh, get better very quickly with just a little bit of contact with nature, yeah. learning, creativity, um, physical health, um, you know, child obesity is mm -hmm. linked to this. Now, now we're talking about really a pandemic of inactivity that right. is producing myopia in epidemic measures. The good news is that we can turn all of that to good news. We, right. The more our schools have nature and the more our houses, the more our yeah, gardens, our gardens <laughs> are, right. are involved. The more contact we have with the natural world, and to a degree we're going to have to create that natural world. Yeah. Well, then, and that's the beauty, I think, of the nature principle. It's this very uh, anti-apocalyptic book, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, we're so used to thinking about the, the future in terms of negatives, of yeah. decline, yeah. of uh, damage, of, you know, loss. Yeah. But uh, it, the book is filled with hopeful ideas about a future that uh, where mankind uh, plays a healing role, uh, mm -hmm. a very proactive uh, role in, in healing the world, and gardening has a central role in it. Yeah, and it's way beyond sustainability. You've got to do that. Very right. important to have energy efficiency, but that's not enough. We'll never get to that unless our goal mm -hmm. is a lot higher. Um, but we're, we need to be very careful how we talk to our kids and ourselves about the future. I'm convinced that most Americans carry around images of the far future 
that in their heads that look a lot like Blade Runner and Mad Max and Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. It's a post-apocalyptic uh, future. And in fact, for young adults now, the number one literature genre is called dystopic fiction. Mm -hmm. And it's even beyond vampires. I mean, in, oh, the, yeah. in these books, even vampires don't have a good time. <laughs> uh, uh, but if, 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 if we're accepting that without uh, a, a positive alternative, mm -hmm. then we're really in trouble. Right. Uh, I mean, Martin Luther King didn't talk, his, the name of his speech was, as others have said, wasn't I have a nightmare. And it wasn't that he stopped talking about the bad news, but he held out this promise that, that someday, it would be better. And people had images in their mm -hmm. head, and he often said that any culture, any movement, will fail if it cannot paint a picture of a world that people will want to go to. Yeah, We've been failing at that. So it's time to get busy on that. And that's part of the reason for the nature principle, at least take, you know, within my limited abilities to, to paint some of that picture. Well, one of the beautiful pictures you paint is of a, a national park composed of gardens. Yeah. And, and, and I yeah. love that idea. Yeah. Doug Ptolemy, who is a botanist in Delaware, has written a book called uh, Bringing Nature Home about the power that gardeners have to bring back biodiversity by using their backyards and front yards. If we, you know, it's not just the Amazon rainforest. What if we did this? And his idea, um, you know, my wife talks about creating a butterfly zone in our neighborhood by mm -hmm. planting native sure. plants that bring back butterfly migration right. routes. Doug takes it a step further. He says, what if it wasn't just our yard? What if it was that yard and that yard and that yard and maybe over to the next city? And what if it went all the way through North America mm -hmm. or the United States? And he calls that if we start today, we could create the first homegrown national park. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait for gov uh, government. We don't have to wait for anybody. We can start it right now. Think of the power that kids would feel if they were part of something that, that large. And we need those big, bold, beautiful metaphors, yeah. really, to to erase uh, the negative images that yeah. people are carrying around. I think it's a great concept. There's a there's a metaphor I've been talking about that William McDonough, the the, yes, the author course, who right. writes about mm -hmm. that says every everything right. everything uh, that we do uh, mm -hmm. can be re recycled and should. Um, I visited his office a few uh, weeks ago, months ago. And I saw this architectural drawing. He's working on a hospital in Spain. Beautiful drawing. One side, solar panels done in the colors of a butterfly that's going extinct in that region, power region. Another side is a, is a green wall. And then a third side is a vertical garden that will feed the people in the hospital. So, okay, this building is, yes, saving energy, but it's also producing human energy. It's mm. going the next step through the food, through the, you know, people get well right. faster if they have a view of nature, but he doesn't stop there. The bottom floor of this building, if it gets built, uh, is all glassed in, and they're going to raise butterflies there, the butterfly that's about to go extinct, <laughs> and they're going to open the doors and make a ritual of it every now and then, mm -hmm. and let Love those it. butterflies uh, go in their community. And well, they're going to they're gonna get all kinds of other people to help them with it. Well, that's a beautiful idea to close the, uh, our conversation with Rich, the idea of opening doors to a new future filled with uh, fluttering wings and uh, uh, people fed and nourished through the environment that they create with their own hands, which is in our power to do. Yeah, and people will, some people will dismiss that as overly idealistic, and to me, that's the point. We need those beautiful yeah. ideas. We need your work out there in, in yeah. the community. And thank you so much for the contributions you have made to the, the life of this country and to the ideas that are out there. So it's always a pleasure to see you, Rich. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on Central Texas Gardener. Well, thanks, Tom. And coming up next is our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards. In keeping with the theme of this week's show, I wanted to talk a little about family gardening traditions. One of my favorite gardening and holiday traditions is the annual live oak pruning at my family's house. The trees are over 30 years old now, and we've been pruning them many years. If you have a live oak, you'll know that they're prolific branch producers, and many of those branches will be heavy with lots of side branches, weighing the tree down and decreasing air circulation in the canopy. In nature, live oaks grow very close together, and so prolific branching is often a competitive advantage. But in a landscape where your live oak hopefully has plenty of room to grow and spread, this habit can be annoying at best and unhealthy for the tree at worst. 
Heavy branches droop down, even touching the ground in some cases, and can break more easily. But if you'll selectively prune the tree, you can remove that weight and give the other branches the space they need to grow. Once I started graduate school at Texas A&M, I learned just enough about pruning trees to be dangerous, and enough to know that our family live oaks would do much better if we pruned them. So when I returned home every year for Christmas holiday, we spent a day out pruning. My dad was up on the ladder with the pruning saw, and I was down on the ground, pointing out each limb to cut, and then running back and forth across the street to get a wider view after each limb dropped. My mom was responsible for taking photos and directing traffic, while my nephew dragged all of the limbs to the backyard to my brother, who was manning the chipper shredder. Now, after almost two decades of yearly haircuts, the two live oaks at my family's house don't need much work, but the two young oaks at my new home in Austin are just starting to take off, so maybe the tradition will move to my house this year. Live oaks are such beautiful trees, but there are other wonderful species of oaks to choose from, so our plant this week is Monterey oak, Quercus polymorpha, also known as Monterey oak. Like live oaks, Monterey oaks are semi-evergreen, meaning that they retain their leaves through the winter but drop them all in the spring. This tree has a more upright shape than live oak and the leaves are much larger. It gets about 40 feet tall and is a great choice for a larger landscape space. Mexican white oak performs best in well-drained, even rocky soil, so if you have clay soil, you may want to choose a different tree. Since it's sensitive to being overly wet, once established, you really shouldn't water it except in the hottest, longest of dry spells. It will require a little pruning to raise the canopy, but otherwise won't need anywhere near as much shaping as a live oak to be healthy. The new growth is frost tender, which I learned the hard way after fertilizing my tree just a little too early last year and having all of my luscious new growth completely frost bitten. It didn't take long to grow out of that damage though, and after an abnormally wet fall, I expect my Monterey oak may spring up several feet this growing season. To do in this garden this week, start planning for some holiday gardening traditions with your own family. Obviously, I would recommend tree pruning, but if you don't have any trees to prune, there are lots of other great activities. Plant some bulbs, build a birdhouse, or cut some greenery for a holiday garden. And if you had any holiday poinsettias, challenge your family to try to keep those alive until next Christmas. Go ahead and remove the foil from around the plant, give it a good drenching, and then let it dry out for a while before you go ahead and put it in your closet next year, about eight weeks before the holidays, and try to get it to bloom again for you next year. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions, plants, and holiday traditions from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Tricia. Mint has a well-deserved reputation for being a pretty aggressive plant in the garden, so I tend to grow it in containers. A 12-inch to an 18-inch or even a 24-inch pot for one plant is actually fine. You could put a few annuals in to uh, uh, decorate the pot if you'd like, but it will eventually overtake the entire pot. Now, it's a hardy perennial here in Central Texas, and we can cut mint all year long. It grows really well in partial shade or filtered light. You can grow it in full sun if you give it a little extra water. It even grows in ponds, so it uh, is well, well, well adapted for most areas. Now, mint likes to be fed regularly. Give it some seaweed, some fish emulsion, and pot it up in a well-drained potting soil. I really like to choose named varieties of mint, like chocolate mint or double mint or Kentucky Colonel spearmint, and Egyptian mint is another favorite of mine. The named varieties tend to have a better, a little bit better flavor. Smell it before you buy it to make sure it's what you want. Trim it frequently to keep it in the optimal health. You can cut just the tips out or you can cut long stems. Grow it near your kitchen so you get it, so you use it really often. One of the things you'll notice with mint is it has stems that are square and the leaves are opposite. And uh, that's true of all the mints. Bees like the blooms, but I do like to cut it back before those blooms have a chance to go to seed to keep it really healthy. You can uh, give it a little compost and fertilize it after you cut it back to the ground and that'll keep it in good shape. But every once in a while, you're going to have to just empty that pot out because it'll be a mass of roots and you'll need to start over again with another mint plant. 
You can cut mint in bunches and hang it to dry, just to tie them together with a rubber band. Or you can dry mint sprigs in a dehydrator to, for use in teas all winter long. If you don't have a food dehydrator, you can still dry mint quite easily. Just cut the tops off of the uh, mint and or strip the leaves from the stems and put them on a cookie sheet or a tray and put them in a cool place that's dark and well ventilated. Stir them up every couple of days. And when they're really nice and crispy, uh, then you can put them in a jar, but you wanna make sure they're very, very dry because they'll mildew if they have any moisture at all. And uh, then you'll have plenty of mint for future use. You can use mint in smoothies and vegetables and fruit salads and teas. And uh, I like to just cut mint like this and put it in vases and uh, use it indoors when I'm having people over for drinks and they can garnish their drinks with the mint of their choice. Ladybugs love mint and they'll lay their eggs on it. Some of the pests that are a problem with mint would be snails, worms, sometimes young caterpillars will attack your mint. But other than that, it's really pretty carefree and easy to grow. Um, mint is easy to root and you can just cut the a stem of mint and cut some of the lower leaves off. You need to reduce the number of leaves that the plant has uh, to in order to uh, get it to produce roots. And then you can root this cutting in water or you can just plot it up in a pot and you'll have mint growing before too long uh, and you can share it with your friends. For Backyard Basics, I'm Trisha Shari. Thanks for watching. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and be sure to check out our blog. Until next time, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.